Welcome to another lecture in the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute series. Uh, we are in the clan house of Sea Alaska Heritage Institute in Juneau. My name is Chuck Smythe, and I'm the senior ethnologist here. And we're very happy to have Dr. Sherry Blumenthor talking with us today. She'll be lecturing on the title is A Short Trip into the Surprising Reproductive Life of Seaweeds. Dr. Umanzor will provide an overview of seaweeds, highlighting their distinctive characteristics and the intricacies of their reproductive life, exploring their various strategies to ensure their survival and adaptation in their unique marine environment. Her abstract reminds me of the book, The Secret Life of Lobsters. I don't know if you know that one. <laughs> nope. <laughs> well, it's sort of about the reproductive life of lobsters. Uh, Dr. Sherry Umanzor is an assistant professor and mariculture faculty at the University of Alaska Fairbanks in Juneau. She started her life with seaweed working on kelp restoration in Baja, California, Mexico, and then transitioned to engage in kelp selective breeding on the East Coast, eventually venturing into mariculture research in Alaska. She has a strong commitment to sustainable, innovative, and inclusive approaches in food production, which make her a valuable asset in the academic community and to Southeast Alaska. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for that introduction. I'm actually very happy to be here. It's, it's my first time in the clan house, even though I'm from Juneau. Shame on me. Um, it's such a beautiful space. So. I actually have to Google it and I say, wow, that's, that's really remarkable. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much for joining either in person or via Zoom. And I hope you have a good uh, 40 minutes to come. So as Chuck was saying, I'm a university professor at UAF and I got to Juno three years ago. And trust me when I said that I never ever dreamed, aspired, or anything related to be a professor or work for the university. It just happened. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how did I got kind of here or to science and then take you with me into a short trip and I'm gonna step here because I feel a little bit short and this feels better. So I, I've been working in food production systems for a very long time, maybe 12, 13 years now, growing food in aquatic environments. Um, I grew up in the tropics so my main focus at the time was either growing uh, fresh plants, uh, wild fresh plants for human consumption, or developing systems in which we can grow terrestrial crops in flotation, like that image in the uh, bottom corner. We had corn, 
We had bell peppers, tomatoes, green beans, and eventually you can harvest that. And the idea was to try to remove a little bit of pressure from land and move it into the water. So a little bit, I don't know, maybe futuristic. Then um, I transitioned into growing shrimp and seaweeds in cages. And this was as, a, as an approach to try to mitigate mangrove deforestation. I don't know how familiarized we are with the shrimp industry when it's farmed, but it's pretty much you clear cut mangrove and you dig big holes and put shrimp. So the idea is can we shift this way of production, move it into the ocean and bring another um, opportunity of economic income. But really most of the time I've been invested in seaweeds, um, how, how to grow them really. Um, so a little bit of the story and this is how I didn't want to be a scientist at all. So my seaweed journey started back in 2010. I was hired for a professor to install a seaweed farm like the one in Tanzania over there on the left or right, depending on how you look at the screen, <laughs> and do something like this in Costa Rica. And trust me, I wasn't hired because I was skillful in seaweeds. I was hired because I was an okay swimmer and I can deal with mosquitoes pretty well. And at the time I was super young and I said, well, you know, it's, it's a tan, it's a nice tan. <laughs> and I'll get paid to get tanned. And when you see these images in Google, you never imagine how hard it is. And again, I was very naive, so I asked, you know, how hard can it be, right? Very hard. It's very hard. I failed miserably, miserably, like month after month after month until one day I say, I don't know what I'm doing. And well, I knew I didn't know, but I accepted that I didn't know what I was doing. And I was ready to get fired. And honestly, I was feeling happy about being fired because I was super sick of seaweeds. So the day came and my boss called me and said, Sherry, come to the office, this is not working. And I said, no, it's not working. Mm -hmm. Ready to be fired. And I pretended to be sad, but I was actually happy because I wasn't gonna see seaweed ever again. And, and then the worst thing happened. He told me, fix the problem. <laughs> I need my farm. And I'm, and I'm level zero. I know, I know seaweed is, is seaweed, but that's it. I didn't know anything about how they grow, what they like, what they don't. So guess what, I, I had a bigger problem because I needed to fix the problem. So I started st studying on my own, really, how do I grow seaweeds? What do they like? How do they attach? When do they reproduce? How, they, you know, all of these questions that are so basic, but I was a total ignorant. Eventually I learned a bit about it and, you know, 18 to 12 months later, I transitioned from that, what's supposed to be a farm, to crops that actually look more like farm-like, um, farm-like, um, yeah, growth, I would say. So flash forward, I knew I wasn't going to get fired because now it was worth it. But I was pretty tired of seaweeds. I didn't want to see them ever, ever again. And the only honorable way I found of leaving the job was getting into a PhD. <laughs> and I did that hoping that I was gonna get away from seaweed and it didn't happen because I'm here today. So that's a, that's a short story of how I got here. Um, but now let's go into something um, more amazing. So today I wanna invite you um, to come with me into a short trip of, to the surprising life of reproductive, uh, surprising reproductive, reproductive life of seaweed. So let's start with, with the basics. And honestly, I have quite grown very fond of seaweed, so I, I really like them now. So seaweeds come in many shapes. Uh, some are super leafy, some are branchy, some are a combination, some, some you didn't know, what, you don't know what they are. If you touch them, they have many textures. Some are super smooth, some are more like crusty, some are like leather, um, many sizes. Like we have the giant kelp, which is so many feet uh, in size. And then you have tiny things that you don't even know they are there, but they are. They need four basic things to grow. And these four things need to happen, yes or yes, except for a few exceptions. They need a source of light. It can be from the sun or a light bulb. Um, they need a source of, CO, of carbon, usually CO2. They need nutrients um, like nitrogen, phosphate, and they need somewhere to attach, although not all seaweeds do need attachment. But that's a generality. Yes, they look kind of like plants, and we often call them plants. Um, they have a hole fast that resembles the roots of a plant. They have a stipe that will resemble the stem. 
and they have a blades or, or a blade that will resemble leaves. Now, a key characteristic here with land plants or the land plants that produce flowers is that there is never, ever, ever a flower in seaweed. So if you see an aquatic plant or something submerged that produces a flower, it's probably a seagrass. So always say seagrass, but never seaweed. Now, unless you are an artist, if all of you were to get your box loaded with seaweeds and I ask you, please organize them based on similarities, you will end up with something like this. Greens with the greens, reds with the reds, browns with the browns. This is kind of useful to keep them organized, but it's not, a fair, it's not fair to organize them and call them similar because it will be exactly like if you did this. I give you a box full of animals and I say, group them based on similarities. If you put greens with the greens and you call them all the same, um, it's kind of not correct, right? So the same is for seaweeds. We use that kind of um, aggregation or grouping just for, for the sake of organizing things. So as you can imagine, or maybe not, if, if they only share color as a characteristic, we can imagine if we think in terms of reproduction, maybe, maybe they do not reproduce the same, right? Because we all can agree that the fish over here and the ladybug, yes, they're yellow, but they do not reproduce the same. So yes, we have rockweed, we have ribbon kelp, they are browns, but they do not reproduce the same. So let's explore modes of reproduction. So in general terms, seaweeds can go asexual, sexual, or some sort of combination of both. Now, here is where it becomes like tricky. Some seaweeds prefer to go asexual more most of the time. Some seaweeds prefer to go sexually most of the time. Some seaweeds are 50-50, depending on the environmental conditions. Some seaweeds do not go asexual whatsoever. They can only reproduce sexually. And to date, there are some that can only go asexual, although I think this is just because we haven't discovered the other way. Because it will be weird to think that they will only go asexually. All right, so basics, all possible combinations. Okay, so let's uh, dig a little bit deeper. We have asexual reproduction, and the most typical ways are either having seaweeds that grow proliferation, so imagine you growing an arm over here and then you drop the arm and the arm creates a new you, right? Or the other way is if you split yourself in two and then you create another you. So we have proliferations and fragmentation. So either way, these pieces will float by currents, they will attach somewhere else and poof, you have a new, entirely new organism right there. So this is very effective, very low cost in terms of energy and very popular in the seaweed world. Now we have sexual reproduction, and you can imagine that it has to be a female and male somewhere, right? Female will produce an egg, males will produce sperm, so not very different from humans. So let's go back to our friend, rockweed. And by the way, rockweed is so ordinary that it's very easy to overlook, but it's a remarkable, remarkable seaweed. I'm going to convince you, think about it. Low tide, summer, super hot. They are toasting right there, and there we go, tide pooling. We step on it, right? We're really stepping on a plant. I told you it's not a plant, but I will use plant. You are stepping on it, or it's winter, right? They are covered with ice, and there we are again, stepping because we wanna go tide pooling. How come it doesn't die, right? It's so remarkable. We, we couldn't withstand these kind of forces as they do, but then the tide comes and it floats, like it, nothing happened. Isn't that remarkable? I get so excited because, you know, it, it's a it's thing like, to be able to withstand this. Anyway, let's go back to the reproductive cycle, right? <laughs> so for rockweeds, we have male, male rockweeds and we have female rockweeds. Male rockweeds release sperm into the water. Female rockweeds release eggs into the water. Somehow they meet, fertilize, and then you create a new organism that will either become male or female. Simple, right? Simple, yep. Check. So I just told you that they do not reproduce the same. So how does uh, Raymond kelp and any other kelp reproduces, right? Seaweeds, some seaweeds have this intermediate stage that is not very typical in plants except for fern. But let's not go in fern. So there is this, um, stage that precedes 
the egg and sperm. And these are spores and gametophytes. You don't need to learn these names because I will repeat them over and over again, so don't worry. Okay, let's, let's go into the ribbon kilt, right? So there is a, there, 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 there are two sexes, so gametophytes will either produce eggs, uh, female gametophytes will produce eggs, male gametophytes will produce sperm. So here we are. Let's start here with our, actually the pointer is gonna be helpful. Yeah, let's start with our adult ribbon kelp. Difference number one be, be, um, with, with uh, rockweed. I told you that rockweed, there is a female and a male. In kelp, this is a female male. So the same, the same organism is both, so to speak, right? So there is no a female kelp and a male kelp, it's only kelp. In the case of raven kelp, they house the spores in the little wings that are towards the base of the plant. So when you go type pulling, look at these wings and they house the spores over there. Right here, the spores will eventually be released into the water. They will swim somewhere, they will germinate into either a male or a female gametophyte. Males produce sperm, females produce eggs, they're fertilized, and then you have a new individual. So it's a little bit more complicated. It's an extra step, but nothing crazy, I think. Okay, check, check. So we are in the browns and pretty much this is a very, this is the most popular or common methods of sexual reproduction when we talk about browns. What about reds? <laughs> so black seaweed, it's called black, but it's, it falls within the red category. Honestly, black seaweed, it's something out of this world that really challenges the mind, at least, at least my mind. <coughs> so we're gonna go to these a little bit slower. And this is a beautiful image from Hakai. So we have our blade here. And the blade, in this case, is a gametophyte that looks nothing like the picture that I showed you before because that gametophyte that I show you from kelp, it's microscopic. We can only look at it under the scope. And in this one, we actually see it naked eye. So this is the same thing. It's a male female, <laughs> right? There is no female black seaweed and male black seaweed. The same blade will house both components. And they are housed towards the tip of the blade. So if you're black seaweed harvesters, you will notice that eventually as we move into spring, it starts degrading towards the tip. And that's because they are becoming reproductive and they release um, uh, male and female components. So we're gonna stand right here. So the male component is usually more towards the edge and the female component is a little bit below right here. The fertilization occurs and they produce the first kind of spore. These spores, gets released, it goes into a substrate, and it settles. Okay, we're breeding. We're breeding there, right? It germinates into something that we can never see naked eye, ever, ever, into a filamentous stage that eventually grows and produce its own set of spores. These spores do not need to be fertilized because fertilization already happened once here. Spores mature, they grow, they are eventually released, they settle once more, and then this germinates into a big blade. <coughs> so try to remember this cycle. I'm going to take you through what is life in the intertidal, and then you're gonna say, why did they choose this method? But it works, right? So 10 years ago, 13 years ago, this was me trying to learn these things from a book. And I said, uh-uh, see what's time for me. I have to walk away from this. I'm never gonna make a living and many other thoughts. Anyway, someone figured this out. So people like me don't have to think about how do they reproduce anymore. We just go and read it, check a video or I don't know. And then think about other things that are more amazing or, or more intriguing to me at least. What does it, what is it like to live underwater? Have you ever wondered? Like not in cities, I'm not talking about cities, but you, with your skin, walking in the ocean, fishing, eating underwater with the protection of nothing. And water is moving, remember, always remember that. We can see that it's still, it isn't. 
And honestly, you know, I, I thought about this a lot. And the truth is that the life that an organism experiences underwater is the result of how big or how small it is. So if you ask a whale, how is it to live underwater? You know, the experience that the whale has is so different to the gametophytes, um, to the sperm and egg over there where the arrow is. It's so different. So let's dig a little bit deeper and let me zoom here and look how small they are. You can draw a dot with the tip of a pencil and you can fit more than 10,000 sperm in that dot. Eggs are a little bit bigger, but you can still fit a thousand. So let's zoom out. We see this beautiful. You put your face there on a tide pool and you say, so peaceful. <laughs> it's nothing like, it's nothing close to peaceful when you are so small. I'm gonna show you what I think what life is like for sperm and egg when they are trying to meet. Um, <laughs> and, it's, and it's hard to imagine that because we are not that size. But imagine you, you trying to eat breakfast when you have a tornado on top of you, right? And tornadoes are occasional. But other events in the oceans are constant. They, they happen in a matter of seconds or minutes or hours. Because let's go back to the very beginning. Second, second slide. Seaweeds use or need sunlight. They need a source of carbon. They need um, nutrients and they need substrate. These four conditions occur at the same time at shore or near shore. And what else happens at shore or near shore? Waves. Breaking waves. I don't know if you have ever had the opportunity to look at the structure of a wave, how it looks underwater, but I have a video here and I'm gonna play it twice. For now, just, just look at it. It doesn't matter if it's a 10 feet wave, if it's two feet, if it's one inch, the structure remains. So this is, this is obviously a bigger wave because it's created for humans, but if you are right there standing in the intertidal and you have a little wave that is breaking, you, it's, it's, it's neglectable to us, but not when you are sperm and egg. So I'm gonna play it again, and you're going to try to experience this as sperm and egg that are trying to meet in the ocean, right there. I mean, outside, sandy beach, right there, uh, awake, awake, yeah, super tiny. Now, I'm gonna play it again, and look at how impossible it is. And they don't swim. How is that possible? Isn't, isn't that, that remarkable, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Let me go to the next one. And still, seaweeds thrive. And seaweeds like black seaweed, they like these kind of environments. So when we think about the reproductive life that they have spore one, spore two, I can only imagine, really, why? Why don't create just a sperm and egg and meat? Done, no, but they have to go to the cycle twice when you have breaking waves. That's amazing, that, that's amazing to me and these are the kinds of questions that really fascinate me and I guess convince me to stay in the uh, space of seaweeds and learn a little bit more every day and say why, 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 how, how, how. So I'm obsessed by these things but I, I, I don't know, in a sense of admiration, I really cannot admire them enough because we as humans, we cannot stand in the intertidal and we stand the waves that they do, but they do, so that's amazing. You know, so I think that despite all odds, and just like the guy from Jurassic Park said, life finds its ways, and, and to me it's just fascinating to try to understand how come, how come we have these beautiful, beautiful seascapes, 
And you know, when I think, just to leave a little bit here with, um, I know I'm the maricultural faculty and stuff, blah, blah. But then I, I think about these things and I say, well, what, what is the price that we pay to modify an intertitle, for example? What, what are we losing? What are we gaining? Like, if we go and harvest, how do we preserve? How do we collect? And I'm not teaching anyone. I'm just asking these questions for me. How do I do it? How, how do they withstand? But you know, um, life is amazing. That's all I can tell you. Seaweeds are beautiful. They are not boring. They are not something that tangles in your feet. They're actually remarkable organisms that to a great extent sustain life in the near shore. So I think we can take advantage of that, admire them and respect them, enjoy them to the best of, of our abilities. And with that, I'll, I'll leave it right there and hope for many, many, many questions. Is it more a plant than an animal? It's more a plant than an animal. <laughs> yes. Oh, one more. Um, when you're making it to eat, is there any reason to add sugar to it? To add sugar? Yeah. Like in these, uh, the companies that sell it in jars, they all have, seem to have added sugar to it. Oh, honestly, I think you add sugar because sugar is addictive. So if you're thinking it, it <laughs> <laughs> and salt isn't. <laughs> There's that can remind those who are watching on YouTube that you can use your chat and ask questions. And I'll read it. Hi, I'm just wondering if there's seasonality to these cycles too, or if it's just, you know, whenever they get a chance, they would. Mm, great question. And this is the, the answer that I really dislike. It really depends. <laughs> um, there are seaweeds that are very, very seasonal. And you can see it, for example, in black seaweed. Um, there are seaweeds that are, are there most of the time. Like, um, let me go back here. Like Olva, the sea lettuce. Let me escape. Uh, let me go. Yeah, like. This one over here, it's there year round. It really requires a lot of nutrients, but can do okay with little light. It also depends on the latitude that we're, where we're at. Um, so yeah, typically they follow uh, the seasons for reproduction. I think we have some. <laughs> species that reproduce asexually, um, those clones can be more susceptible to certain diseases, like what happened with um, the bananas in the 1900s, and so I'm wondering if there's um, like certain seaweed that are more susceptible to disease or if that's like an issue, especially with farming operations. Mm, okay, that's, that's, that's the question. Sorry, that's a big question. No, that's okay. So I think naturally, if you not you, but if, if a species always goes asexually, it's more vulnerable because you have less genes to cope with life. Now with farming, as we know here in Alaska, because the, the species that we grow, we have to go yes or yes through the reproductive life, the, ace, the sexual life cycle. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not so much of a problem unless we always get the same stock. Okay. Yeah. Do certain species of seaweed try to accumulate? Yes. And which <laughs> ones? <laughs> try to accumulate. You yeah. mean like if they accumulate anything? Oh, no, no, no. I mean like a heavy metals. I know phyto accumulation happens, happens in certain general lots of Yes, and I wouldn't be able to give you a list because that's the only, like, we haven't studied all of them to know, but I will say all of them have the potential too. Yeah, 
So remember, they, they are like sponges. It's not, okay, so here is a, so they do have a hole fast, but the, the hole fast is just an anchoring system. It's not like a root, like a plant they absorb from there. Seaweeds have the treatiness of the water, so they uptake everything from there. And that's why they are such good sponges for good things and bad things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So could you go back to your, um, your slide that we had black seaweed reduction? Sure. I had a question from that. Yeah. Great question. First, cues, light and temperature, typically. And this is not only for black seaweeds, but it's for, for all seaweeds. Some of them wait for it to be darker, and some of them for it to be lighter, or for water to be colder or warmer. So that's, that's the one. So just to point out, those cues are true for these, and they are true for these, for that phase. And I, I guess for every phase. And then, uh, the second part of that question was, what kind of barnacles? Wow. I think it's more about the calcium carbonate of the barnacle than the barnacle itself. So I will go with any type of barnacle, but I, can, I could be very wrong. So don't quote me on that. <laughs> how to collect them better, but whatever they're doing is working well. Okay. Are there harvesters here? Share. We have a, we have a question online, uh, a couple questions, and then I'll come back to somebody over there that had a question. Um, the first one is, does the salinity of the water impact black seaweed reproduction? Hmm. I'll go with no. I don't think there is an impact on reproduction per se. Yeah. Oh. Mm -mm. All, although there are people that will say yes, I'll go with no. <laughs> well, this is more of a comment, but enjoying watching this from New Zealand. Thank you. Hmm? Very similar seaweed communities here. Lots of coastal sedimentation smothering our reefs from land use practices. Recent historical flooding exacerbated the life of our reefs near shore communities. In Alaska or? Sure, sure. <laughs> okay, this is, this is in general. Um, so the <laughs> seaweeds do not grow as a, con like, yeah, in, in continuity from the tropics to the temperate zones, right? There are breaks, and those breaks are given by temperature, so there are thresholds. So that tells us that seaweeds in Alaska are cold water seaweeds. So the number one challenge right now is the waters are warming quickly. Not quickly enough for seaweeds to adapt. Some are better than others, but not quickly enough. And this is true for many other organisms. So which ones are in danger? I wouldn't give you a list, but I will say that those that 
grow on their typical cold waters. And here is a easy example, Arctic kelp. That will be that will fall into the endangered category pretty pretty soon. It's not endangered right now, um, so it's it sometimes it's hard to pick and say this one is the one that is endangered and, and figure out why. I know black seaweed is a concern. Is it endangered or not? We don't know. We don't know enough, and that's a shame. But a beauty too, because then we have to go and look. So there are cycles, there are cycles. Having a bad warm year, it doesn't mean that it's gonna stick, well, stay like that for a long time. It can get colder. Um, so yeah, I wanna give you a list and say these ones. Except for, yeah, no, except for no. <coughs> no, it doesn't apply in Alaska. <laughs> Um, well, I learned about it recently. Um, the Alaska Institute hosted a meeting with uh, wild harvesters and then scientists to try to understand for how long this has been happening and what can be potential causes. And I know that the institution is, is spearheading the effort into understanding that. So right now, we don't know exactly like what is causing it or how long has it been there or what's the geographical um, extension of that. Yeah. Today, the answer will be no, and I'm gonna explain that. So the state has a very conservative approach to mariculture. Um, farmers or hatcheries are required to select 50 different parental individuals to function as broodstock. And this is, try to, is trying to bring a lot of genetic pool such that there is not only one or two, and they have to go out, like every season, they have to do the same process. So if uh, farm kelp floats somewhere else, you are technically not damaging the genetics. The other important consideration is that farms cannot collect seaweeds beyond the 50 kilometer circle. So if say you're a farmer from Kodiak, you cannot bring kelp from Southeast and plant it there and vice versa. So there is regionality in that sense. And the other third important aspect is that right now any sort of selective breeding to improve any characteristics is prohibited by the state. Um, in the future, we don't know if that is gonna change, but when selection and genes being limited, if that is gonna pose a threat, that's something that will need to be evaluated at the time. Yeah, but for now, um, we're good, <laughs> so to speak. What contributes to the health of seaweed, of black seaweed in particular? Adequate conditions for growing. So if there is uh, nutrients that are required, if the temperature remains cold, if there is not enough sediment. So sedimentation, as in the, in the comment, is a, big, is a big issue because remember that they have this microscopic stage. And if you have a lot of sediments, you will block light and they will never grow in, and release the spores. So keeping water clear, cold, shining, um, with the adequate nutrients, absence of pollutants, uh, you know, these are like babies, they're fragile. Thank you. I was wondering, um, 
if the nutritional value of the seaweed has changed with the modern warming? Beautiful question. That's what I want to answer. Yeah, that's uh, my next project. I actually want to understand how the nutritional content changes not only over the years, but over the season. Say, I'm gonna make this up. Say you're going to go and harvest black seaweed in April. Is it nutritionally different than if you do it in, in um, what's the next month? May, May or June? Um, and this will give us ideas. Like we will, the idea is to track the changes in the water, but also in the seaweed and try to imagine what it will look if it gets warmer or colder. Yeah, so yet to be determined, two more years and I'll, my note. <laughs> yeah, you should talk to some harvesters because there's only a brief window of two or three weeks where they harvest seaweed for black seaweed for drying purposes. Yes. And so you might window that. <laughs> and a follow up on um, what was asked about uh, the harvesting practices of black seaweed. I'm just wondering, would the idea that she shared earlier about uh, when you're harvesting the black seaweed, about taking off the tip and leaving that, would that ensure that the reproduction continues? Because there have been um, some reports of over harvesting of black seaweed. Um, and so I'm just curious, if you did leave the tip, would that ensure that the reproduction continues or has the damage been done or what, what would you recommend? I, I actually learned on, on this meeting hosted by Sea Alaska Institute that in British Columbia, right, the elders actually take the tips and they spread them through the rocks. So maybe, maybe it helps. Yeah, and just to add to your question, I think that it doesn't matter if you take all of the blade or if you leave a little piece because that little piece will die. It completed its cycle. It's going into the microsc microscopic stage already. So as long as there are, you know, the sperm and egg already are released and the spores are there, you can pretty much harvest everything. When does that happen for black seed, do you know? Yeah, so you will start see that the, the, the blades, you will notice this because the tips start degrading, it's very visible. And that's more towards, mi towards mid-June, but correct me if I'm wrong, it goes more towards mid-June, yeah. yeah. So ideally, that's why you don't collect earlier, because then you're bringing everything home.